Welcome back to the Hybrid Athlete channel. I am Dr. Paul Rimmer and today I am going to talk to you about nutrition recommendations for hybrid athletes and concurrent training. Before I get into this, I just want to separate things out a little bit. So when we talk about hybrid athletes, we're talking about people who are typically trying to operate at both ends of the performance spectrum. So someone who might be doing lots of endurance work, ultra marathons, Ironmans, triathlons, that end of the spectrum, and also trying to negotiate the world of gaining muscle and strength. Um, maybe not always at the same time, but there's always a focus on those parts of their program. When we talk about concurrent training, typically speaking, the literature on this is more directed towards athletes that, as part of their sport, have to focus on both strength and power development, as well as some components of, of, of aerobic and anaerobic fitness. So the recommendations here are from a, a chapter of a book which talks about concurrent training, but this is mostly in the context of something like rugby, um, where you know there's got to be lots of strength, lots of power, muscular development, but also an aerobic component to that as well. So we just have to kind of bear that in mind as we get into these recommendations. So this is the book here, and this is the chapter here, which is nutritional considerations for concurrent training. So we're going to discuss carbohydrate intake, protein intake, a little bit about carbohydrate timing, and then quickly go through th through some supplements, but I'll do a separate video on that. Okay, so let's have a look at protein intake. So as you can see here, it says the protein intake recommendations are about 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per, per day. I'd extrapolate that further and say that's on like a lean mass basis. Now, I've done a video on protein recommendations before, and I'll link that right about now. Although that protein recommendation mirrors what is generally stated for athletes across a range of endurance and strength sports. I think when you are talking about anyone who's trying to maximize their strength, anaerobic performance. So the recommendations for protein here as well um, are that 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram. Now I've talked about protein before and why I would always be at the upper end of that spectrum. So I'm not going to go through that here. If you want to watch that, what my protein recommendations would be for both strength athletes and endurance athletes, because I think we might be missing a trick here. From a nutrition perspective, I've linked that there. One of the recommendations that they've got here, though, is that protein distribution should be fairly evenly distributed across the course of the day. So 20 to 30 grams of protein across, you know, four or five meals or snacks a day of high quality proteins that provide all your essential amino acids. Let's talk about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates important because it fills up the glycogen in our muscles and our liver, which supports us in maintaining blood glucose levels and allows us to perform at higher intensities. Again, I'm not going to go into uh, carbohydrate and glycogen metabolics in this video. I'm just going to talk really loosely about the recommendations without getting too much into it. So what we need to think about here is the recommendations for carbohydrate intake are really related to most concurrent sports, which might not have as, as high a carbohydrate demand as, say, a really long training day if you're training for ultramarathon where you're out for maybe like four or five hours for a training run. So we need to look at these in the context of taking a slightly broader view, depending on the, the sports that we're going to include in our hybrid training protocol. One of the things it says here, though, is that carbohydrate loading, so if you've got a big event, a big run, at around about 5 to 7 grams per kilogram has been shown to enhance performance. So we have to consider, although this is a recommendation for a carbohydrate loading, loading phase at 5 to 7 grams per kilogram a day, we also have to consider that most hybrid athletes and concurrent training athletes or sports which require elements of concurrent training will be training for more than a few hours a day so i would always suggest that for hybrid athletes you know as a really a really simple baseline if you're training for more than two hours a day have a look at how many carbohydrates you're consuming per gram and if it's not within that range then that's a real first initial point i would look at we're trying to maximize our carbohydrate intake or at least get our carbohydrate intake within a reasonable range so again that's talking about loading but if we're always training with that high volume, if we're always training for more than a couple of hours a day, and particularly if we're doing things that are working at higher intensities, you know, like resistance training, power outputs, power output type training, uh, interval sessions, um, and even aerobic set, like high intensity interval sessions and aerobic sessions at a high enough intensity, which are always gonna have some element of carbohydrate usage, unless we're not doing a very low intensity, then we're really gonna be reliant on carbohydrate. And actually, even if we're doing those kind of zone three sessions, I'm sorry, those zone two sessions, we're still gonna need some blood glucose there, particularly if we're gonna go for long durations in terms of um, ultra marathon training and things like that. So we need to have a massive awareness of that. 
This is where people can often get confused. So we have to think about this from the perspective of a hybrid athlete. So I'm gonna do strength and endurance. Now, typically speaking, one of the belief systems was that like we need to get carbohydrate in as quickly as we can after exercise to facilitate recovery. That's not, that's not important if we're doing one session a day. However, if we're doing multiple sessions a day, that really does mean that we need to be getting carbohydrates in quite quickly, particularly if we're splitting those sessions across the course of the day. Now, here's where the waters can become a little bit muddied. So there's a lot of research, or some research, I should say, coming out about this idea of training low, which is training in a low glycogen state. So after we finish training, or if we're doing longer sessions where we're gonna deplete glycogen, this is shown to trigger some of the signal pathways which might elicit endurance adaptation, which means in an aerobic context, if we've got a long, slow, steady state session, which isn't easy to say, we might want to not refuel straight away. If we've got plenty of time towards that next training session, we might wanna leave it for a few hours to allow these adaptive signals to take place. However, what I would say is that despite the fact that there does seem to be some evidence that these signaling pathways are enhanced by restriction of carbohydrate, that there's been no real evidence that this has a significant impact on performance at this point. And also, if we're training multiple times in a day, particularly if we're splitting our strength and our endurance work, we're really gonna to wanna to make sure that carbohydrate is there because we don't wanna have a negative effect and carryover into our strength, power, hypertrophy type work. It's also been shown that aerobic exercise or all exercise causes a breakdown in muscle tissue as well as strength training. And therefore, restriction of carbohydrate has also been associated with more muscle protein breakdown. So if we're looking at maximizing both strength and endurance, yes, there might be some theoretical advantage to restriction of carbohydrates in terms of aerobic adaptations through these adaptive signaling pathways. However, that also means that we might be breaking down more muscle, which then becomes a problem. So does that mean that we should always fuel with carbohydrate, even if we're doing a low intensity run? The answer to that is no. So restriction of carbohydrate intake might have a negative impact on our net protein balance, our positive protein balance, because if we're breaking down muscle and we're not stopping that breakdown, then that also means that we're obviously not creating an environment for optimal muscle growth or recovery from strength training. So does that mean that we should then just always fuel with carbohydrates? Well, not necessarily, because we do know that after a strength training session or even after a resistance training session, if we provide adequate amounts of protein, that will slow down. We know after, even after an endurance training session that we should, we also know that after an endurance training session, if we provide enough essential amino acids from a high quality protein, and that really stops this muscle breakdown process. And ultimately what that means is we can use this train low, which might give us some theoretical advantage to maximizing our aerobic adaptive pathways, as long as we're making sure we're providing adequate amounts of protein so that we don't drive our body into this catabolic state, which is breaking down muscle tissue. Because if we're looking to maximize performance in both strength and endurance, Protein really is the key mediator in terms of supporting muscle recovery and muscle building processes, hypertrophic processes, but it also is a key mediator in preventing muscle breakdown so that we can maximize both elements performance. So ultimately what this means, and the recommendations here say that carbohydrate intake should be between three to seven grams per kilograms per day, that's fine and well and good, for what I would say concurrent athletes, which we're talking about rugby players and things like that, which will be doing aerobic and strength on the same day. However, if we're a hybrid athlete and we've got days where maybe we're doing several hours on a bike or out running or whatever it might be, we might actually be able to get into this low, this low glycogen state. In fact, we probably would do if we're working at an intensity high enough for a long enough, long enough duration. And therefore, we don't necessarily need to worry about flooding our body with carbohydrates to support recovery quickly from a muscle protein breakdown perspective as long as we're having in enough protein. So it does mean that as long as we're doing our long endurance days as a standalone day with plenty of time for recovery before we get into our next strength session or high intensity interval session or whatever it might be, we could theoretically use this sort of train low or not fueling glycogen recovery to maximize these adaptive responses to aerobic training and still be able to include that in a concurrent plan. However, what I would caveat that with is at the moment, 
the evidence isn't clear to say whether doing that actually has any performance benefit. So what I would say is if you've got a long session, but then you've got an adequate amount of time to just you know take a few hours to slowly trickle carbohydrates back in without flooding the body and trying to get food in quickly, then you can do that and it's not gonna have any detrimental effect on your strength training the next day. And it may have some aerobic benefit. However, if you have sessions within the same day, you need to be meeting those carbohydrate demands. You need to be up that higher end of that carbohydrate intake range, you know, close to the seven grams per kilogram for most people, particularly if you're doing two, three hours work of endurance work a day and you've got a strength session in the same day. However, I've talked about concurrent training before and hybrid training before and how we split training and the impacts of the interference effect. And again, I'll link that video here. And as you can see here, we don't even really need too much carbohydrate in order to maximize or amplify or augment is the word they've used here are muscle hypertrophic or muscle um, recovery processes from strength training, resistance exercise, because protein alone can do that as well. So carbohydrate probably plays a more limiting role. However, over the long term, I do believe that higher carbohydrate diets are gonna impact performance. They are gonna impact recovery and they might have some small impact on the hypertrophic response that we do get from our resistance exercise sessions. So finally, and I wasn't gonna put this um, image on here but i'll explain why i did first so the reason i put it on here is because i think it's a really good point is to say just because it says something in a textbook doesn't mean that you have to fundamentally agree with it so it says here uh the different areas so you've got anabolic and aerobic adaptation so things that are gonna help um promote the recovery from and adaptations from resistance exercise you've got anabolic adaptations which are just more purely you know, muscle building type stuff. And then you've got aerobic adaptations, which are things that are gonna help with aerobic performance, okay? So let's go through whey protein. So it says daily dosage, 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilograms a day. What that should say is that total protein intake is 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram per day, of which some of that can be whey protein. So let's say you're 100 kilos and you need 1.7 grams per kilogram a day. I always talk about the upper end, so I'm gonna call it two grams per kilogram per day. So that's 200 grams. I might have two protein shakes a day, which are 30 to 40 grams. So that would be 60 to 80 grams of protein. The rest of my protein, I am gonna get from whole foods mainly. Just the way that table is written isn't very clear. Dosing, dosing regimen, 20 gram dosage every three to four hours. Again, the how much you should have in terms of a dose every three to four hours is gonna be determined on your body size. For example, 100 kilos, if you had 20 grams every three to four hours, you did that five times a day, which would be you know 15 to 20 hours, it's still gonna be 150 grams of protein. That might not be enough. So what I would say with that is, it's total protein intake over the course of the day is more important than you know splitting the dosage every three to four hours. But you do if you do wanna split your dosing regime, Take how much protein you have that you require in terms of grams per kilogram and divide that by four or five. If you require 200 grams of protein, divide that by four, you take 50 grams of protein, divide it by five, you would have 40 grams of protein within each meal. And you wanna, you wanna split that throughout the day. And then it says here, supplement period throughout training. So I think with that, what it means is like how long you would take it for. And I would just say permanently. So I don't think that even needs to be throughout training. I think most people would benefit from a higher protein diet. And then it says practical considerations there. Precise timing is irrelevant as long as total daily intake is sufficient, which is kind of what I was saying before. So carbohydrates, we've just talked about that. It talks about there about dosing regime. Carbohydrate amounts should be adjusted dependent on training volume. And again, there's just some practical considerations there to talk about um, when you should use carbohydrates um, in and around training. So HMB, this is one I have a massive issue with. The recommendations on that are based off some really bad research. Basically, the research on HMB is published, it is out there, but it is widely criticized. N3 PUFA, which is a omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. The recommendation doses are five, four to six grams a day. It gives you the dosing regimen and you know the period you should use it. I personally think that if you don't eat oily fish, you should have one to two grams or 1,000, 2,000 milligrams of omega-3 a day. Um, and I would use that more for health benefits rather than thinking it's got any anabolic or aerobic adaptive effects. Yes, there might be some benefits there, but that's likely to be in those who are under consuming a healthy amount of omega-3s rather than those who are um, consuming sufficient amounts. So I don't think that 
supplementing them on their own is is some kind of magic bullet for aerobic or muscle building performance benefits. I think the research on that is um, slightly sketchy. We also have creatine on there as well. So you move back to anabolic adaptation. Again, I'm not going to go through everything that it says on there in terms of loading phases and stuff as well. But creatine is great. Things it will do though is it will increase water levels in the body. You might get an increase in weight, which might be relevant to some endurance sports. We might want to cycle on or off it, depending on our competition calendar and what we're doing. Um, and say I would say that like once you're on it, unless you need to come off for a power to weight ratio benefits, then stay on creatine. Stay on it. it. Sounds like I'm talking about steroids there as well. It's not a steroid that people think. Vitamin D is something that I think we should supplement with at certain key times of the year. Recommended dosage there are fine. The solic acid and phosphatidic acid, again, are other ones where, personally, I think that the research around that is slightly sketchy. Um, so personally, wouldn't bother with it, but I would say, like, again, do your own reading around that. Go to a website called examine.com, check out their stuff and see what they say on that. And just not, I'm not convinced is what I'm trying to say. With aerobic adaptations, you've got carnitine, which has got some interesting evidence, because in order to get the benefits of carnitine, you need carbohydrates to elicit an insulin response in order to uh, get carnitine to be taken up into the muscles. Has it got some performance benefits, potentially? How much performance benefits does it give? Meh, like, again, it's one of those like is it worth the cost it's not massively expensive is it something i've used yes is it something i've noticed any benefit from not really you've also got nitrates in there as well which act as sort of hydrogen and acid bus acid buffers in the body which are you know which may have some impact positive impact on um, aerobic performance as well so i think it says there when it says anabolic adaptation and aerobic adaptation it's a bit misleading actually because it's not the adaptation those things actually um support it's the performance element which then would cause the adaptation so yeah i think the table's a little bit mislabeled there as well as well as them misspelling the word supplement period well the word supplement misspelling it but i make spelling mistakes all the time so i'm not judging from that i'm just surprised that's made it into a published kind of textbook type situation there are also a few other supplements on there as well which may have some benefit in terms of performance so things like bicarbonate but again, they're not mentioned on the table and this isn't a supplement log, so I'm not going to get into that. So what I would say is that um, that if that list, protein is useful, carbohydrate, obviously intake is useful and some things like carbohydrate powders are useful. I'd say electrolytes are probably useful if people sweat a lot. So that's something that isn't on there. Omega-3 is something that is useful, but I would say you don't need to take high amounts of that, especially not in the dosage regimes that I mentioned there. I would say that actually just one to two grams a day to meet your general health needs would be useful, particularly if you don't eat all your fish. Creatine, I'm a massive fan of, so I would say yes. Vitamin D, I would say yes at certain times of year. Ursolic acid and phosphatidic acid, I'm going to say, yeah, like whatever floats your boat, if you want to spend some money on it, go for it. Carnitine, meh, yeah, same again. Nitrates, meh, yeah, some benefits. Um, and, but I would say HMB, save your money. The research on it is massively flawed. Right, guys, hopefully that's been useful to you. This wasn't so much a sports science short as a sports science long, um, but there was a lot to get through today. Right, take it easy, guys. If that's been useful, please give me a like and a subscribe somewhere around here, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Peace.